Whoa, buddy. Put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. Welcome to the party, pal. The, the, the Michael Dukes Show. The greed and the entitlement is astounding to me. What more could you want from a low-budget radio program? This is a dumpster fire. That was just BS. It is time to get a new perspective. We know just what you need, and we've got just the cure. Open wide and prepare for a steaming hot cup of freedom. I just don't fathom it. The Michael Dukes Show, streaming live across the world. Live around the world on the internet at MichaelDukesShow.com and across the state of Alaska on this, your favorite radio station, and or FM uh, translator. Good morning and welcome to the program. Another beautiful day here in uh, Alaska. A little foggy, a little cloudy after such a gorgeous day. Um, yesterday, uh, the weather turned here in South Central. Apparently, it was nice all day down in the peninsula and pretty nice up in Fairbanks. Uh, a little cloudy here yesterday, and then it cleared right up and became a scorcher. And uh, nice, nice stuff. A uh, little, little foggy right now, a little hazy and, and cloudy outside the studios. But uh, I imagine that that could burn off at any minute and we could have another beautiful, beautiful summer day. Maybe it'll be a, maybe it'll be a late summer. Maybe it will be, um, you know, maybe it'll be a, 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 you know, the Indian summer running into September. I, you know, a guy can hope, right? A guy can hope. Just be, be, be positive. It's going to be nice. It's going to be beautiful. I can't wait. It, it, just forget about it. It's going to be fantastic. Um, <clears throat> anyway, welcome to the program. It is the Michael Duke Show hump day, middle of the week. Uh, we can see Firearms Friday from here, and we are going to be ready to dive into things and uh, jump in and see what's going on. I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait for the big uh, for the big Friday. But uh, right now, we've got uh, all of today to look at, and today is going to be a oh man, today's going to be a good day. We have got uh, some great stuff lined up for us this morning. We're going to start things off uh, in hour one here with uh, a couple headlines. Um, I, I, I have some commentary, and then we're going to, uh, and then we're going to pick it up with our friend JD Tuchili from Reason Magazine. I, I told him yesterday. I said, "Man, I feel like I'm kind of abusing our friendship here by keeping to ask it." But he's all, he's got some good stuff, and today it's a little bit different. Today we're going to talk about space. Uh, we're going to talk about the space race and no, not the space race between the U S and the USSR. That was the famous space race, right? No, this is the space race between government and private industry. Uh, JD has written an article about Americans love for NASA. Um, but the fact that the people seem to love NASA but it's the private firms, it's the private industry that seems to do the, uh, it seems to do the real work of uh, continuing to go into space. And we're going to talk about that kind of dichotomy there, and uh, and we, we shall we shall discuss. So it should be a uh, should be a fun a fun top a fun topic a fun talk here this morning in hour one with JD. Chu uh, to Chile uh, from uh, senior editor over there at Reason Magazine, and then we're going to uh, we'll go through that in hour one, and then in hour two, we'll pick it up um, with uh, State Senator Mike Shower, who, uh, as we discussed last week, fingers crossed, uh, we should be uh, talking about. I think we're going to talk about a little bit of history. I think he wanted to talk about the importance of things like, uh, you know, in the in the the battles of the Pacific in World War II. We'll probably, you know, we're going to talk about uh, Midway. 
We'll probably talk a little bit about Wake and some of the aerial battles. Specifically, he obviously, as an aviator, as a military aviator and as a commercial pilot, he has a, a, a big interest in the aviation battles that were fought um, uh, during World War II. Mostly, I, I think uh, we're probably focused on the Pacific, but it should just be a fun conversation. It's one of my favorite topics, uh, and it's not one that we get to broach here on the program too often. And so we'll just have some fun. We're going to just have, we're going to have to try, we're going to just have to try some fun today. So we'll see, we'll see how we like fun. Maybe we'll go back to the grind of bitching and complaining and, uh, and doing all that stuff tomorrow, but today we're just going to have some fun and, and, uh, enjoy ourselves. So anyway, Yes, I know. Shocking, Bill. Bill says, ooh, newsflash. I'm going to have some commentary. Yes, I'm going to have some commentary on a couple of different things. And I don't know. Here's the thing. This is maybe where I get to gripe a little bit and not necessarily have the answer. But there's a couple of stories where I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Uh, we'll talk about um, we'll talk about that here in just a second. But first, of course, the big breaking news that's out across every headline in the country, uh, and that is, of course, that uh, the uh, the grand jury has returned with an indictment of uh, former President Donald Trump, who has now been um, who has now been uh, indicted on charges, three separate charges, uh, including that he tried to overturn the 2020 presidential election results. Uh, conspiracy to uh, defraud the United States government and witness tampering. Uh, so the the absolute, I mean, the whole, uh, I don't know. We got a former president under indictment. We've got a current president and his son that are kind of under indictment or at least under investigation. And at some point I just look in the mirror and go, why are we just, Why? Why do we continue to look at these things and go, these people will save us all from whatever? I mean, regardless of what your political persuasion is, it's either one or the other, one guy or the other guy. Somehow they're going to save us from the... No, these people are the problem. I'm sorry, in case you hadn't noticed, these people are the problem. And uh, it's... Why do we keep looking to these folks to uh, save us from ourselves or from whatever else? Um, I'm not going to get down into that. If you guys want to go out and read out about it, you can find uh, what's happening. Essentially, the uh, grand jury announced a four-charge, 45-page indictment against uh, Trump related to his role in the January 6th situation. Uh, It was not unexpected. The special prosecutor, Jack Smith, had already warned the Trump legal team it was coming. The grand jury named three conspiracies, again, that he was accused of. Conspiracy to defraud the U.S., conspiracy to obstruct an election, and conspiracy against people's rights. Um, uh, Trump is already facing several other charges, including financial dealings in New York and the whole hush money thing with Stormy Daniels as well as federal charges of uh, mishandling classified documents. So his plate is pretty full right now. That doesn't seem to slow people down, though. On Saturday, he held a rally in Erie, Pennsylvania, attended by over 4,000 people. And a few days later, an estimated 50,000 people went to see him at uh, Pickens County, South Carolina. So it's, uh, I guess, not... Uh, you know, some people either don't care or believe the whole thing's made up and it doesn't matter. So it's kind of like, kind of like a game of whose lines is it anyway, where the points don't count and everything's made up. Right. So I just, I don't know. I, you know, at this point, I (laughs) just reserve judgment on the whole thing because again, we keep looking to this one person somehow who's going to magically make it all better for us in the presidency. And I think what ends up happening is usually, generally speaking, we all lose out more every time somebody gets into the presidency because it's it just doesn't matter. Just doesn't matter. I can't affect it anyway. So <clears throat> let's go back and talk about things that we can affect. Um, all right. So a couple different stories uh, here uh, as we get started. 
First and foremost, uh, if you've been in the Anchorage area, you probably heard about this guy, Sean Ahmed. He was attacking people or threatening to attack people on uh, trails in the area surrounding Anchorage and South Central. Um, it was reported, uh, was it yesterday or was it Friday? I can't remember which day that he was reported that they had got, you know, they'd picked him up after several cases of, uh, people reporting that a man had come out of the woods and everything else. Well, he's, he's at it again. Uh, he was arrested and taken into custody and then subsequently released and then arrested again because he showed that he was, you know, he was out and released. And then this last Sunday, um, he was out on the trail again, this time appearing in front of a, a group of hikers brandishing a stick. Uh, they all had bear spray uh, to and so they used it in an attempt to defend themselves as he tried to block them for passing the trail. I'm just waiting for this guy to meet up with somebody who's carrying a 44 Magnum for bear protection. Um, and then he was apprehended. Now, he was initially apprehended in that separate case last week, but was let go. Uh, the whole thing is, is in the end, the timeline looks like this. He was um, He was arrested on June 25th for assault and criminal mischief charges, then released the next day. And then he was arrested on July 28th, just a month later, and <clears throat> for same kind of stuff, released by the court, and then was back in custody on July the 30th. Now he's he's back in, and they have set, uh, the his attorney has set a requested $1,000 bail, and this time a third-party custodian, which is a live-in, It'll be within him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He, so he can't go out and, and uh, you know, make make more mischief at this point. But, I mean, the guy's been in and out doing exactly the same thing. This is his third uh, arrest for this in so many, in, you know, just four weeks. There's something going on. What's going on there? I mean, this sounds, if nothing else, this sounds like a cry for help, right? I mean, he's... Is he? I don't know. They haven't reported that he's actually hurt somebody, but that he's been doing criminal mischief and damage and and threatening. That was the latest one. The threatening where he was, he had the stick and he was swinging the stick to block the path or whatever. It just sounds like this guy's got some uh, issues. And the last time that this happened, where they just kept the revolving door out, I remember. Um, that the last time this happened and it had escalated is where that guy walked up to the gal at the Lusak library and stabbed her in the back, just randomly stabbed some random person. This person, the, the attacker was nutty and had been in and out, uh, with behavior and threatening stuff. And it attacked other people and just kept coming in and out and in and out, uh, obviously with some mental issues. Um, but it was only until he actually stabbed and paralyzed a woman that uh, they did something serious about it. This just seems like this could just be one of those escalating things that maybe you should pay a little bit of attention to what's going on here. Just maybe, you know? Uh, so that was the uh, uh, first story. Oh man, I'm already up the thing. Um, there's another story that if we don't get to today, we will definitely get to tomorrow talking about how the state of Alaska has decided to use crowdsourcing to distribute $2 million in COVID relief money to teachers for public school supplies. And while this is a novel concept and very interesting, I do, <clears throat> I do have some questions. I have a few questions and, uh, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to discuss this, uh, probably, uh, maybe the later today or tomorrow morning. But I remind me, remind me if you're out there in the chat room to talk about this whole crowdsourcing of teacher, of public school supplies for teachers. Because, <laughs> I mean, this is a novel concept, but uh, again, I have questions. All right, uh, we're going to continue. Our one is uh, continuing right now. JD to Chile from Reason Magazine is about to join us. And we're going to talk about space, the final frontier. It's going to be interesting uh, for me anyway. Hopefully for you as well. That's the goal here. We will return 
on your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio, The Michael Duke Show. We're broadcasting live through a series of tubes. Allowing all of these entities to provide streaming stuff going on on the the, the internet. Well, it's kind of hard to explain. Sorry. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Okay. Welcome back and good morning to all of you. Uh, let me get caught up real quick in the chat room. I see JD's in the green room. I'll get to him in just a hot second. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Brian believes that God shines on him specifically because there's no clouds in his place, which might, you know, speaking of crazy, you might want to have that looked at, man. I'm just, that's called weather. Uh, 73 today is what Terry says. It's going to be 73. Today. I mean, I don't know. It was, it was hot yesterday, man. Finally, finally. I mean, we get to August 1st and we finally get one of the really nice days of summer. What did we have before that? Like four days of sunshine in the entire summer. I mean, I'd like to have my money back. Really? I mean, just please, could I get a refund on that? Fun day Wednesday. Um, well, again, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, that, uh, history stuff with, uh, state Senator Mike Schauer. Uh, Bill's got to tease us with food, bacon, mushroom, cheese, omelet cooking now. Ooh, that sounds good. Bacon, mushroom. I love me a mushroom and cheese omelet. I know some people hate mushrooms. I just, and something about them and eggs are just delicious. Um, okay. Uh, he needs a padded cell. It, he'll attack the wrong. See, that's the thing. That's what I thought. This guy out on the trail, he's out there swinging sticks at people and they had bear spray, which could have, you know, basically put him down. But I mean, it's Alaska. He's going to go out there on the trail and meet somebody who's the 44 Magnum who's going to put a, you know, you're going to Mozambique drill the guy right there on the spot if he keeps threatening him and they'll be totally justified in doing it. I mean, is he looking for suicide by hiker or uh, by cop or what? I don't know. It's there is a mental health crisis in this country ever since we shut down the institutions in 85, 86, whatever it was during the Reagan administration. I'm not saying that those were great institutions. I'm just saying we didn't have an alternative. We shut them down without having an alternative. And the next thing you know, we've got an explosion 25, 30 years later of homelessness and everything else and all this on the street. And a lot of it, I think, is surrounding the the fact that we don't have any mental health facilities that are able to deal with some of this stuff. So I don't have a solution. I'm just saying I can see the problem. I don't see the solution to it. There you go. That's my full kick. I got to shut up here. I got JD too chilly over here on the line. I mean, I've already abused our friendship enough to force him to come back on the program in such a short, quick amount of time. Hello, my friend. How are you this morning? Doing well. And you? Doing good. Man, You are you outside in the sunshine? I'm, I am I, indeed. I am hating you right now. I mean, I, I love you in a loving Christian way. Um, it, uh, it, it's nice. It's nice to be able to be outside and enjoy a little sunshine. Thank you for coming on this morning. Uh, and thank you for doing this. I know we had you on just a couple of weeks ago. I try to keep it down to once every five or six weeks, but this was such a fun story. And it's something that I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do stuff that's not necessarily overtly political because so I get tired of that sometimes. And this is a, this is a, uh, this is a topic that's fascinating. Uh, the fact that the space race has gone from being a race between the U S and the USSR to now it's between public entities and private entities. And, um, I, this is an exciting time to be alive for this segment of the, uh, you know, you may be, you know, you may be regretting a lot of the other stuff out there, but this part is an exciting time to be alive. So I'm looking forward to uh, diving down into this with you. So, uh, did you get assigned this or are you just kind of pulling your own stuff? I mean, what, is this something that you've been following? Or? It's one of the ideas I pitched, uh, every now and then they throw an assignment at me and say, could you please cover? But, uh, this one really interested me. Yeah. I mean, this is a fascinating, the rise, the rise of the industrial, of the private industry, the rise of space, um, uh, you know, business, basically space business, which I think people like Heinlein and others, you know, kind of, you, you know, prophesied and talked about. 
Um, and that was where a lot of the impetus of this stuff came from. So, all right, well, let's, uh, we're about 30 seconds out, JD. So hold the line for me and we'll come right back to you. Uh, don't go anywhere. Uh, JD to Chile, our guest, uh, right here on the Michael Duke show. Uh, thanks for coming and joining us. Uh, don't forget. We'll be, uh, talking to state Senator Mike shower in hour two, and then, uh, be looking towards firearms Friday this weekend. We'll see what's, uh, We'll see. We'll see what it looks like here. And we're talking, seeing if we can get Dr. John Lott back on the program. Hopefully we can talk to Dr. Lott and, uh, and get a feel for it there. All right, that's it. Let's do it. Here we go. The Michael Duke show. Seriously humorous with a pinch of intellect. <laughs> pinch of intellect. Sorry. That is humorous. Here's Michael Dukes. Yep, just a pinch. I'm not. I'm not saying that I have any more or any less. Just a pinch of intellect. Uh, maybe we'll exercise a little bit of that today as we continue to go forward here. Uh, our guest this morning is J. D. Tuchili, who's a contributing editor for Reason Magazine, and I appreciate him coming on board. Uh, normally, like I told him earlier, we try and. I try not to bug him too much, but he writes so many great things and I got to kind of pick and choose my articles that I want to talk to him about. Um, but uh, today I thought I could not pass this up because it's one of the topics that's near and dear to my heart. We've talked about this on the program several times. We've had people like Rod Pyle on, who is a worked at JBL and NASA and things like that. But um, this, is a, this is a fascinating topic and it's kind of talking about the space race but not in the way that you think. The space race used to mean the USA versus the USSR, right? That was the big one. But now this has become more of a space race in America between the uh, government and NASA and the big bloated military contracts and everything else and the lean mean fight machines that are SpaceX, Blue Horizon and uh, or Blue Origin and uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, which are companies, private companies that are doing the vast majority of the heavy lifting in space and how public perception has not quite shifted yet. We're going to talk about that right now. Good morning, JD. Good morning to you. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you, my friend. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure. It's always uh, fun stuff. It makes the day go by great. Um, so let's talk about this. Um, uh, JD, you said this is something that you had a real interest in and, and, and I as well, I've been watching this. I got to be honest with you. Uh, that first time when they, uh, I, there's been a few times when I've watched some of these original SpaceX launches where I might've had a little tear in my eye as I watched this thing go, when they dropped the Tesla into space and the rocket man and all this private stuff. And the first retrieval of the landing booster, uh, self land on the landing booster. I may have gotten a little tear in my eye. Like this is what, as a kid, that's the kind of stuff that you dreamed of. And it's finally getting done, but gasp, it's not the government doing it. It's private industry, um, although that's not necessarily what the perception is. So give me the rundown here overall. Well, absolutely. I mean, I riffed off of a, a Pew Research poll. They asked Americans about uh, you know, space exploration and uh, who they thought should be kind of leading the way. And two thirds of Americans said that uh, NASA should be heavily involved. And only a third said that uh, private companies were up to the task of taking it on all by themselves. The funny thing that is, though, that the private companies already really are taking it on by themselves. NASA hasn't had a space capability since they uh, closed down the shuttle program in 2011. Uh, they've been reliant on others, private companies or the Russians, uh, ever since to deliver cargoes to space and also to get crews up to the International Space Station. Um, this, the Planetary Society, which was uh, co-founded by Carl Sagan back in the day, pointed out a couple of years ago that if it wasn't for SpaceX, uh, NASA would be entirely dependent upon Northrop Grumman, uh, which is another space company, um, you, you know, to add to the list. But Northrop Grumman to get cargoes to the space station and on the Russians to get crews up there because NASA didn't have any ability of its own until they finally tested their space launch system last year and had a successful test of it. You know, and that will be crew rated when it's um, fully functioning. But it's not really a new space launch capability. They just went through the spare parts bin, more or less, pulled out old shuttle components, stuck, stuck them together with some new tech. But it's a you know, it's another expendable uh, and very expensive way of getting back into space that will finally give NASA uh, a space capability of its own again. 
but not a competitive one. It's really still a game left to private enterprise um, who are moved ahead, have reusable space vehicles, and can do so at competitive rates. NASA will just be able to say, hey, we got rockets once again, and we can get into space on our own if you don't mind paying 10 times the cost. That's the thing that kills me on this. Uh, when you look at this, because the, the SLS, the Space Launch System, uh, was touted originally as, oh, this is going to be the next big thing. This is the next latest and greatest. This is, you know, and it's and it's billions of dollars over budget, like billions of dollars over budget. And everything from, uh, what was the article that I saw here a couple months ago? It was talking about the spacesuits that they're building for the, the spacesuits they're building for the moon landing, for the SLS system and everything else. And these spacesuits are big and cumbersome and they do, and they cost millions of dollars. And Elon Musk over at SpaceX built this spacesuit that's like, uh, I don't know, it costs $60,000 or something. And it's just, you know, and it works and it's flexible and it looks more like something you'd see on like the Expanse or something like that versus this big clunky, your arm sticking out thing. And it, it just, it, it was like in, it just keeps reinforcing this idea that while NASA had its place in the day, that it has become nothing more really than a boondoggle and a jobs program for the senators and the Congress critters who's, who's inside whose districts many of these feeder companies or things are done. I mean, that's really what it's become, right? It's been more about the jobs and the prestige and pouring the money into NASA than actually getting into space. It really is. I mean, uh, Rick Simberg, who's a analyst of long standing, pointed out when the space launch system was first announced about, you know, about a decade ago when they were um, retiring the shuttle system, he pointed out that the real purpose of the space launch system, given that it was old tech, it was expendable, which meant that it was inherently going to be expensive. You'd have to rebuild a space launch rocket each time because it's just going to be blown up in the process. He said its real purpose was just to funnel money to congressional districts so they could build the components and share the wealth with their with their constituents and get reelected to Congress. It wasn't really a space launch system, despite the promise. Um, so the space launch system does give NASA a capability, but it's kind of a circa 1990 capability or even earlier, while um, Blue Origin and SpaceX in particular and Virgin Galactic and Northrop Grumman have had to build modern vehicles that are cost effective because they have to compete with each other and with overseas competitors to win customers in order to uh, deliver cargoes to space and, of course, cruise to the International Space Station. So NASA is kind of back in space, but really they're back into uh, you know lining the pockets of uh, congressmen and, uh, and helping them funnel money to the districts. Yeah, and I mean, and this money could be much better spent on other things since there's already a demand. I mean, the the fact, and, and especially at the cost, that's what kills me. Uh, SLS, I mean, they say, oh, this will be good for dozens of launches and blah, 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 blah. But except, except for the fact that it costs $2 billion per launch. Yep. $2 billion per launch. And SpaceX is doing it for like, Two hundred million dollars. I mean, that's you know the same kind of thing. Two hundred million, one hundred eighty, one hundred ninety million dollars, and 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 they get to reuse the stuff. Two billion dollars per launch. At what point don't you go? That's not very cost effective. Oh, at all. I mean, the Office of Management and Budget uh, was asked about this, and they looked at the Europa project, which is coming up. The Europa project is actually required by by uh, you know law written into it to use the space launch system in order to uh, send um, its mission out um, you know, to the, you know, the far reaches of the solar system. Um, and the Office of Management and Budget pointed out that each launch was going to cost $2 billion, whereas if they went with commercial uh, launch capability, um, it would cost about, uh, there would be a savings of $1.5 billion uh, yeah, at least uh, on each launch. That's ridiculous. Um, and the fact of the matter is, by and large, um, the space launch system costs about 10 times what the commercial capability is. Uh, what they're trying to do, I mean, the Biden administration put out its space strategy last November, right about the time they finally had a successful space launch system uh, launch years and billions of dollars after it was supposed to be delivered. And it wasn't a coincidence because you can't have a space strategy if you don't have a space capability. And the plan is to return to the moon. That was actually announced under the Trump administration. The Biden administration is pushing forward. And this supposedly is going to be uh, NASA returning to its glory, visiting um, other bodies out in space. 
except that if you go back to that Pew study, um, when they asked, uh, you know, they asked, okay, what should be prioritized for NASA? What should it be doing? Um, it's not returning to the moon. Only 12% of the respondents thought that that was a mission for Na that NASA ought to be taken on. It was uh, monitoring space for asteroids that might threaten Earth, you know, sort of a national defense protective role, uh, and monitoring the climate. And a similar uh, poll by YouGov uh, from two years ago uh, said that, okay, they should be launching military satellites, not private satellites, not commercial satellites, military satellites. And that was it. Those were the top priorities. So even those Americans who still have fond memories of NASA landing on the moon back in the day, um, even they say that, okay, well, NASA should still be involved, but what it should be doing is as a traditional government protective national defense role. The rest of the stuff, the commercial stuff, should be left to, this, to the uh, private companies who are better at it. And I would love to have seen the questions that were asked in these polls, because I could see them saying, oh, for military roles, launching satellites, that kind of stuff, watching for, you know, asteroid spotters. I could definitely see that. That's great. But I think if they had then asked the follow up question of if those military satellites could be launched for one tenth of what they're being launched, what they would be launched for, which would you prefer? And I'm sure people would be like, well, I suppose the private industry one would probably make more sense. That's what's happening now. Right. Again, NASA yeah. has had no capability. So what have they had to do when they wanted to launch, you know, keyhole satellites or monitoring satellites or anything else? They turned to somebody like Musk or or Bezos or whoever and said, here, send these up. And that's what's been going on. And there's and it's not those are the big ones. There's multiple private, smaller companies that are doing rocketry launches. We've got the Kodiak launch complex here in Alaska where they've got they've been rocking, you know, uh, 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 sending satellites and other things into orbit and doing test flights and everything. It's become a big booming industry. And I think this is just, again, more proof positive where private industry is willing to innovate and make it so that it is affordable. Government has no incentive to make it affordable, but the private industry, they have to do that. Not just affordable, but reliable. Uh, there's a former uh, assistant director of NASA who is a, not a fan of the SLS, and I think that's why she was squeezed out of NASA. But she points out, again, SLS is old tech. It's based on the shuttle. The shuttle was originally supposed to go into orbit 40 to 50 times a year. At its peak, it made it about four or five times a year. So if you're basing the space launch system on tech that never lived up to the original expectations of it, you talk about something that is not just expendable, but isn't going to be going up very often. It's going to be expensive. They'll get it up when they can get it up. Um, and that's not going to be anywhere near as often as they promise. Meanwhile, the Falcon 9 goes up on a regular basis. The Falcon Heavy goes up. The Northrop Grumman Antares series goes up. Um, yeah, the commercial rockets are reusable, go up frequently. They're reliable. The, the, they'll almost certainly deliver your cargo to orbit. And the space launch system, well, I mean, when they get around to it and when, they, when the it tests out, they'll finally put another launch into orbit at a very high cost every now and then. Right. Yeah. No. And again, going back to the whole point that this is not new tech. In fact, one of the quotes in your article kind of gave me a, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it kind of gave me a little bit of a queasy feeling because it was a quote from space.com that said, uh, what, the, when they're building this SLS, they said the component, they're using components that previously flew on 83 out of 135 space shuttle missions have now been assembled into new vehicles, the SLS and Orion space. You, what, you went into the used parts bin? Yep. And you, you went into the wrecking yard and you're like, oh, I'll take this and I'll take this and I'll take this. And you cobble together a new ship out of used parts. And now you're and sending space, it up. The space shuttle was not even 1970s tech. It started off, they started designing it in the 60s. They kind of finished up the design in the 70s. I remember them rolling it out initially. This is very, it's 50 year old technology. Um, and that's not what I think that they want to be relying upon at this point, especially when young, nimble competitors are constantly uh, building new reusable spacecraft that they can land, refit, put another uh, put another payload on, and then send back into orbit. Yeah. Well, and now I know Musk is he's in a little bit of hot water with the FAA over the whole Starship thing, but Starship is, I mean, is closer than, and it hasn't had a successful launch yet, but they he's admitted that they're still doing the testing. That's what they want to do. But this is a guy through iteration has... How many milestones has Musk hit uh, as a first, you know, for all these different things that he's doing? 
I mean, this is a guy who's he's going to do it. Star lifted a star, a star, a starship is going to work and it's going to be the first lunar type. You know, he won the, the contract right for the lunar thing. Um, and so this is this is the way to go. I mean, when do you think that the public perception starts shifting? Give me a, a quick answer because we're going to hit the break real quick. But when SpaceX does something really flashy that sticks in people's minds the way the moon landing still does, that's when uh, perceptions will shift. Well, I thought shooting a Tesla into space was probably flashy enough. But maybe <laughs> that was cool, but it didn't maybe, stay quite the same way. Yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. All right, we're going to continue here. JD to Chili, our guest, uh, will return with more in just a moment. The Michael Duke Show, common sense, liberty based, free thinking radio, talking about one of my favorite subjects, space and the new space wars. Uh, back with more, the Michael Duke Show. Running on 100% pure beard power. Oh, also some coffee. We dip our beard in coffee. Ha, <laughs> nice beard. The Michael Duke Show. D- JD, oh, I hear the birds in the background. That's so cool. Uh, uh, JD to Chili, our guest. It makes me, I, I'm a little envious. I mean, it's nice out. It's getting, it's a little foggy, but, uh, you know, just sitting there. Although I do not. I do not pity you the Arizona sun when it gets super hot. Uh, yes. Because you can't get much more naked than naked, and nobody wants to see this in a Speedo. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can, I, I can I do. We're, we're not down in Phoenix here, but it still gets yeah. toasty. Uh, it's going to be yeah. just uh, up in the upper 90s today, but Phoenix is baking. Oh, man. Yeah, somebody said, what, like 112 or something yeah. in the Phoenix area. I'm just like, how could you even... Man, it, it's like the opposite problem in Alaska. In Alaska, it gets cold. You got to run your car to make sure it warms up so you can at least survive while you're driving it to work. Down there, you got to turn your car on ahead of time so you can get in it without actually melting through the seat, you know, or something like that. So it's kind of the same problem, only in reverse. Um, let's uh, shift gears real quick. Uh, have you been a space fan for a long time? Have you been, you know, as a oh, kid? Yeah, all my life. And, and yeah. in fact, I remember watching the Apollo missions as a kid. Man, it's uh, it's it's fascinating uh, to see. Uh, I was born. Uh, I was born in '69, right when they were coming back from the moon, and so uh, that was a big part. My best friend was born three weeks ahead of me. He was born the day that they landed on the moon. So the two of us had this fascination with space and everything else. And of course, we read heinlein and you know we everything we could get our hands on asimov and and everything and so i've always been fascinated with this idea but i really glommed on to surprise surprise heinlein's writings um because uh, you know the libertarian space cowboy that he was um and kind of this idea of you know private interest pushing out into space and you know uh the the man who man sold, who the, sold moon. the moon yeah man yeah, who sold yeah. the moon and all that um, but it's fascinating to see. And we've actually had some really good um, uh, we've actually had some opportunity to have some really good uh, television or movies or things that have kind of put out. What's your do you have a favorite show that you like to watch in regards to space? Something that you could watch all the time? Well, I mean, yeah, I, Firefly was awesome. Uh, that was a great show. Uh, the Man. Expanse, I got it. Oh, wasn't that fantastic? That's a pity with that died, although maybe it died at, at its best so that we remember it without it having faded possibly. after you know one season yeah. too many or something like that possibly yeah possibly um, the expanse I, I although i lost track of it after about two seasons i was really enjoying that too well i will tell you that um having read all the expanse books uh before the basically before the series started and finished um i will say that that is probably my favorite space uh show because it's so real to life and what's funny is that there's you know all these politics involved and everything else which normally i steer away from on television because i'm like i deal with that every day i don't need to watch i don't want need to watch house of cards you know or something like that but it was so fascinating to see it through the lens of what's happening in space and the space exploration and everything else you should get back into it because it's all six seasons it is an amazing show uh, very good. But in fact, one of the few shows that really treat space um, with the physicality that I think it needs, you know, the actual the physics of the show 
we're very close to is are very close to what real life yeah. physics in uh, in space are like. So definitely an interesting uh, uh, an interesting one. I'd like to see more exploration of that idea of you know kind of the wild west of the exploration of space kind of thing you know that would be I, I would too, and there's a lot of basis to work for I me mean, people like paul anderson wrote about that you had a lot of authors if they were to go back and mine some of that stuff even if they don't translate it directly to the screen at least get the ideas uh because there's been a yeah. lot of great treatments of that yeah absolutely it uh it is interesting uh what's the justification i got about a minute and a half here what's the justification um for uh uh, for going back to the moon in NASA's eyes. I mean, is there anything that we're looking for? I mean, what's specific there? NASA needs a purpose. I mean, realistically, NASA needs a purpose. Um, now, Trump kind of gave them one when he announced that they were going to go to the moon. The Biden administration wants to keep focused on that, too. They want, otherwise, all NASA does is coordinate uh, and, and sign contracts for launching satellites into orbit and probably getting crews out to, this, to a space station that's kind of being abandoned and, and has a limited lifespan. So that's really just about it, finding a purpose. I'm surprised that they're not that, that NASA is not working more on not necessarily the transit factors, the flying and the, you know, the International Space Station, as you said, is I mean, it's beyond its original life, you know, proposed yeah. life right now. Um, we're limping it along. I'm surprised that they're not working on a new space station concept, uh, you know, when they have to either deorbit or push it into the sun or whatever they're going to do. Uh, the I, the ISS, I would like to see them come up with something new, you know, as far as f some kind of new platform. They've actually, they're actually talking about using a starship as a new station. Oh, really? That's the whole, uh, to put the yeah, ship in orbit? Idea. Yet Geo another space. contract. Yeah, just yet. An well, I mean, again, why do we need them again? Remind me about this. I've got, got to know. Um, all right. Um uh, J.D. Tuchilli, our guest here on The Michael Duke Show, talking about space. Um, we'll finish this up and maybe we'll get some of his thoughts on uh, on where things go from here. Uh, we continue right now. Common Sense, Liberty-based, free-thinking radio. Let's do it. Okay, we're back talking about one of my favorite topics, and that is the exploration and the dominance of space. We're going to dominate it, right? I mean, right, that's going to happen. It's so vast and scary. Uh, J.D. Tuchilli, contributing editor for Reason Magazine, is with us. His latest article talking about how Americans love NASA, but private firms are doing the real work in space. Um, and what they're looking at is they think NASA should take up a role more of a defensive looking for asteroids, looking at the climate and doing things like that. Um, but really, does NASA even have a purpose anymore? Uh, J.D. had uh, made the chuckle or the comment of saying, you know, basically, they're just signing contracts. That's all they're doing these days. They're basically a paper shuffling agency. Unfortunately, they're consuming billions of dollars a year in fees to do that when maybe just the private enterprises should be out there. Uh, JD, you said right before we went to break, when, you know what, because I ask you, when do you think that this, the paradigm is going to flip where people don't think NASA needs to, uh, needs to be the dominant player in all this stuff. And you said when something spectacular happens when SpaceX or blue origin or somebody does something spectacular, um, I mean, I'd argue that there's been some stuff out there already. What do you think it's actually going to take? I mean, is is Musk going to actually literally have to fly somebody to the moon on his own to make it work? Or what, what do you think? It, it might be that. It might be a private space station going into orbit and serving as a hotel in space, which actually has been discussed as an idea. Um, it might be starting a mining operation uh, on, on an asteroid or the moon. Uh, it's going to have to be something that's kind of big, sticks in people's minds. And that's going to be hard to do because the original Apollo missions, first of all, were groundbreaking. Um, I mean, it was an explosion of technology and, and capability. And it was also only so many media outlets at the time. You had a few stations to watch and that was it. There's a lot more competing for our attention now. So no matter what you do, it's much harder to gain the public's um, you know, undivided attention, no matter what you accomplish. 
but I think that slowly and and uh, and continuously, these private firms are are going to keep on dominating space exploration, because they can do so anywhere. If one company, if one country tries to shut them down, let's say the U.S. gets a, a hostile to private enterprise in space, they'll launch someplace else in the world. They've got reusable rockets. Their technology is far beyond that used by any of the uh, national-based uh, space agencies. NASA's running out of reasons to exist. We talked about the public sees them looking for asteroids. Let's not forget that there's a military branch that has space as its mission also. <laughs> Why wouldn't the Space Force do that? Why right. wouldn't the Space Force launch military satellites? I mean, that kind of leaves NASA with, okay, mine, monitoring the climate and doing some research, which might be a, a perfectly you know, a decent mission for it, but it's not the grand mission that they once had back in the days of Apollo. So it probably is kind of kind of shrivel as an agency because private enterprise is going to continue to expand. Maybe it won't be in a flashy way, right? but we're just going to wake up one day and realize that everyone's flying out into space on private ships and that the government ones don't matter that much. Right. I mean, it's it's I think NASA at this point is running strictly on inertia. Right. I mean, that's pretty yeah. much what they've they've had to do. They have shriveled and died. Uh, I mean, you point out in the article that they have not they have been basically relying on SpaceX to launch satellites and do things like that. And then they've had to rely up until the Dragon module. They've had to rely on Russia to move U.S. astronauts back and forth to the space station. They have no capabilities to do any of those things. And yet, what's NASA's budget? I mean, it's billions of dollars a year. Of dollars. For what? Now, they do some research. Yeah. They do some interesting work. But it's not. I mean, the Europa mission, things like this, aren't going to command the public's attention, and what they don't, and they don't divert enough money to enough congressional districts. And honestly, every government agency that spends a lot of money, that's a primary purpose of spending that money is diverting a lot of money to congressional yeah. districts. Now, NASA has had some wins. I mean, I will say, you know, the Curiosity rover and some of the things on Mars. Again, a lot of that implemented with private industry in partnership with private industry. But they did, uh, you know, they have done a lot of work there. If they focus just on that, I'm okay with that. You know, get out of the transportation end of space and get into the, you know, rover, satellite, building thing, you know, those kind of things. If that's what they want to do, great. But I just don't think that they can be the only game in town these days for the, and, and, it, and since they can't do it effectively or efficiently, turn it over to the people who are already well ahead of the game and make it that way. I think that makes sense. I mean, what NASA does excel at is things like you mentioned, like uh, like the Mars rover, like, uh, you know, these real hard research that is not going to be taken on by SpaceX or Blue Origin. And that would be an area for them to focus. And they have to get over the ego hit of not being the only game in town anymore. And that's too bad. But uh, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the NASA engineers also are Heinlein fans and they need to remember that. Uh, I mean, if they want to be, uh, you know, running, you know, ferrying passengers up to orbit, if they want to see crews going up to privately owned space stations, they could go work for SpaceX instead. If they want to do the research, they can stick with NASA. It just right. won't be as glamorous as it used to be. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, space elevators. That's what I want to see. When can we get a space <laughs> That would be cool. For that cheap, for that cheap uh, lift up into the, you know, it takes you 15 hours to get there, but it's a cheap flight up into the, up into the space, you know, put a, put a star, put a starship up in orbit with, uh, you know, some kind of microfilament, whatever, you know, at geosync or something. Um, you know, it, it is an exciting time. To me, it is my version of, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a big cowboy, Louis L'Amour fan of that whole westward expansion and exploration of the frontier and that really is the new frontier. And I think we need to capture when I was growing up, that was the <clears throat> that was the idea that captured our imagination. Today, it's almost become commonplace to see, I mean, it's become commonplace now for SpaceX, for example, to recover their ships. How long before we're not recovering boosters, but we're actually flying back and forth to orbit with the same technology with people aboard, right? Not just a booster. Yeah. But a but a but a manned crewed module that flies up and then flies back and lands the same way. How long until that happens? It's only a matter of a few years. I mean, we're really on that path, and you probably could do it now, but not do it cost effectively. They'll it'll when the when the numbers make sense, then it will happen. You'll have to be able to have demand for getting the crew up there before you start flying it up there. 
But right. we're not that far away. I think you and I are going to see it happen. Yeah. No, and especially as you talked about, I didn't realize that they were talking about, <clears throat> I think it was during the break I said, you know, that NASA should be focusing on replacing the ISS instead of all this other stuff. How about a new design? And you mentioned that there's already a suggestion that they just put a starship in orbit and have that be the basis for the station, which is kind of a brilliant idea, quite honestly. Or if they build a hotel, then they'll have that demand for live up and down, uh, landing back on a platform or on a pad or whatever. That's a, I mean, that, it could be in our lifetimes. I've, it would be something that I would look forward to. You know what's going to happen? We've already had the first tourist go to the International Space Station. That space station is going, aware, going away, and that tourist makes it clear that there's demand for going up there, staying, and then coming back down. Somebody's going to put a space hotel up there. It really, yeah. It's going to happen it's just when the numbers make sense, because the, the technology is there now. But once yeah. the numbers make sense, they'll do it. Mm -hmm. Well, i got to tell you, if I won the lottery tomorrow, uh, I would be dialing up Jeff Bezos to say, how do I get on board? You know, uh, that would just be, I mean, that's a childhood dream. I mean, it's just something that, you know, I've been fascinated with for years and, and all the science fiction and everything else and the shows and the movie, just to be up there to see this little blue ball from up there would be a fantastic uh, thing. Final thoughts, JD, to Chili here <clears throat> on this whole disconnect between the public and the private and the, and the space and NASA and, and the people's perception, final thoughts. We, we forget that the whole point of making space travel um, efficient and reliable was to make it boring because things that work and, and become routine are boring. No one is gets enthused about cargo ships carrying all our stuff across the ocean all the time. As space exploration has become has fallen off the radar and become reliable, it doesn't blow up, it takes off all the time again and again and again, well, yeah, the public loses interest. But that's why it's so amazing is because it can be reliable. We can get stuff in orbit. We, we can put space stations up. We can put people in, the or, in orbit and then soon go back to the moon in ways that aren't so risky as in the past. So this actually is, is mission accomplished. This is a sign of how fantastic the technology um, is and how much people have accomplished that, that Americans and the world beyond aren't paying as much attention as they used to. Uh, the idea of mining the belt, uh, of course, is uh, one of the commercial aspects of this that I think I find fascinating. I would love to see that. Technology, definitely not there. That's a long flight, but uh, we should talk about this again sometime in the future because, again, fellow nerds unite, you and me, all right? Uh, Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, J.D. I appreciate it. Uh, folks can find J.D. Tuchilli over at Reason Magazine. Go to Reason.com and uh, look it up. I've linked his new article on NASA and the, and the poll here in the chat room. Uh, thanks so much, J.D. I appreciate it. Hold the line for just one second before, we, uh, before you go off. Folks, we got more coming up. State Senator Mike Schauer up next. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. Have you read um, the book? Oh, man, what is it? Aristillus? Uh, uh, it it uh, was a book about a guy who basically went up on the moon. Uh, Aristillus. Yeah, there we go. Um, oh, who, um, who basically... Who basically? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, um, I'm sorry. It's about it's by the same fellow who wrote the uh, book about Mars, the Mars mission, right? Uh, no, this was a fictional book uh, written by a libertarian guy, um, and I'm just trying. I'm trying to remember his name. I guess I'll I'll look it up here later and find it to you. But basically, a guy purchased. Uh, you know, some scientist came up with basically what was anti grav technology. And he's like, okay. So he bought some ships, like cargo vessels, sealed them all up, got them all thing and put this at it and basically went to the moon with equipment and started digging and boring out and building uh, his own little private city with a Tra bunch of people. Travis Corcoran. That's the author. Travis Corcoran. Travis Corcoran. That's Corcoran. who it is. Yeah. And yeah. if you haven't, if you haven't read that series of books, that's a great series of books. I, ha I have. I'm actually waiting for the next book. He's he's a good writer. Yeah. He's a really good writer. And uh, I've listened to it on audiobook. Sean Renette reads it, one of my favorite narrators. But uh, that kind of thing. I mean, there's going to be some kind of tipping point where some kind of technology allows us to make it just a little bit easier to get up there. And once you do that, 
it's going to be a whole, it'll be a whole new ball game uh, and it'll be the moon or it'll be the asteroid belt. And you get all these people whining about mining and X, you know, raping the earth and everything. We'll just go out to the belt and start doing it. Yep. And that's when, that's when you really, I think when you break the mold is when you go out there and you're able to get resources from off planet and be able to do manufacturing in space. That's when it's going to take it to the next level. And it's coming, but you're right. We, we need a couple of tech ba- breakthroughs along the way, but it is definitely on the way. Uh, it is coming. Yeah, it's it's great stuff. Well, JD, thank you for writing this article, and thank you for uh, thank you for taking the time to come on board. As always, I appreciate your time uh, more than I can say, and uh, I love talking to you. So thank you, my friend. Same here. And uh, enjoy Take the. Care. Thanks for having me on. Enjoy the 97 degrees out there. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, JD to Chili, our guest here uh, on the Michael Duke show. Yeah. Eris. Yeah. That was uh, Travis Corcoran. Uh, Corcoran. Um, uh, let me, I can't remember what the name of the book uh, uh, ran. Um, uh, author uh, Moon. Try to Aristillus. Uh, there you go. Um, he is uh the powers of earth that's what it's called the name of the book is called the powers of earth and uh it is it's a great book it really is a great book very reminiscent of heinlein and some of his other works um oh it actually i didn't even realize it actually won a prometheus award it's such a good book that it it uh it uh it won a prometheus award uh powers of earth and then there's a sequel called the causes of separation and then there's the third one is though i am also waiting for the third one to come out but if you haven't had a chance to uh if you like good fiction and you love it and i would especially um there you go i just threw a link up in the chat room Maybe I should see if I could get uh, Travis on the program to talk about his book because it is fascinating, man. Um, space rides to see the Apollo landing spot on the moon, almost like a submarine ride to see the Titanic. I mean, yeah. I mean, granted, only the richest of the rich can afford to go, but that won't be that way forever. You know, those people pave the way for it to become commonplace. That's, uh, that's what's going on. I just love this. I love that. Um, so, uh, Travis, uh, here's the, here's the synopsis of the book. I'm going to read the synopsis of the book. Earth in 2064 is politically corrupt and in economic decline. The long depression has dragged for 56 years. And the Bureau of Sustainable Research is hard at work making sure that no new technologies disrupt the planned economy. Ten years ago, a band of malcontent streamers and libertarian radicals bolted privately developed anti-gravity drives into a rusty seagoing cargo ship, loaded them to the gills with 20th century boring materials and machines and earth moving equipment and set sail for the moon. There they built their retreat, a lunar underground border town fit to rival Ayn Rand's Galt Gulch with American capitalists, Mexican hydroponic farmers, and Vietnamese spacesuit mechanics, this is the city of Aristillus. There's a problem, though. The economic decline of Earth under command and control economy has caused trouble for the powers that be in Washington and elsewhere. To shore up their position, they need to slap down the lunar expats and seize the gold they've been mining. The conflict starts small but rapidly escalates. There are zero-gravity gunfights and rusted ocean-going flying ships, containers full of bulldozers hurtling through the vacuum, nuclear explosions, armors of teleoperated combat, UAVs, guerrilla fighting in urban environments, and an astounding visual climax. The Powers of Earth is the first book in the Aristilla series, a pair of science fiction novels about anarcho-capitalism, economics, open-source software, corporate finance, social media, anti-gravity, lunar colonization, genetically modified dogs, strong AI, and really, really big guns. It's a joyride, baby. It's a joyride. You gotta go. You should go read this book. Oh, it's so good. All right. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, 
So Wesley Mooch exists in multiple genres, genres, genres. Uh, all right, here we go. Uh, we're going to jump back into it. Uh, the Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty-based, Free Thinking Radio. Like and share, like and follow, do all the stuff. Here we go. Getting back to it. Buddy, put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. Welcome to the party, pal. The, the Michael Dukes Show. The greed and the entitlement is a st- to me. What more could you want from a little bit? Is a dumpster fire. I'm just BS. It is time to get a new perspective. We know just what you need, and we've got just the cure. Open wide and prepare for a steaming hot cup of freedom. I just don't fathom it. The Michael Dukes Show, streaming live across the world. Live around the world on the internet at MichaelDukeShow.com and uh, live around the uh, state of Alaska on this, your favorite station, uh, radio station, and or FM uh, translators. Good morning um, and uh, welcome to the program. It is hour two of the big radio broadcast um, and uh, it's uh, it's. It's it's a beautiful day. It's it's a beautiful day in our neighborhood. We're ready to go. Hour two. We're expecting to hear from State Senator Mike Shower. He has not joined us yet, uh, so we expect to uh, uh, we expect to hear from him here shortly. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Thumbs up. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, it is his off time, and we were just going to talk about. <clears throat> uh, we were just going to talk about history uh, of. Uh, uh, history, uh, World War II aviation history, which I thought was going to be a fun, uh, was, is going to be a fun topic. Uh, we'll see if he shows up, but we just finished up again. Uh, my mind is like racing right now. Uh, for those of you who can't tell, uh, my mind is racing along the lines of what we were just talking about with JD to Chile. Uh, because uh, you know, as a, as a very young child, I was shaped by as a, as a very young child back in the day when dirt was new, I was shaped by a couple of different things. Uh, my mind, my mindset was shaped by a couple of different things. Um, first and foremost, it was molded and shaped in the school of uh, the teachings of Louis L'Amour, right? We've talked about that on the program, that that was a a big part of shape of that kind of shaped me for who I was as a person and the, the ideas and the mindsets. And then I discovered Heinlein and, uh, that was a whole nother tract, uh, to, uh, to run down. And so that's why when you watch things like, for example, the show Firefly, for those of you who have ever seen Firefly, it was like this aha moment for me of, this uh, combination of the westward expansion, uh, you know, and that uh, that kind of wild frontier that uh, that Louis L'Amour wrote about and the idea of of uh, space and geopolitical stuff and self-determination that Heinlein wrote about. And it was kind of a combination um, of uh, of the two. And so when I see something like this and I see these arguments about where things are going in space and stuff like that, it, it gets me kind of excited. Um, you know, every, I think every boy who was born in the, you know, late sixties, early seventies, right at the height of the whole space race and the landing on the moon and everything, um, uh, and everything else, you know, dreams that maybe. I mean, at some point they dreamed, 
I would think, that they would love to go to space. They would love to see what it looks like. They'd love to see what it was about. They'd love to be part of that exploration. And we live in a time now that is, uh, I mean, we're, we're living on the precipice of this breakthrough technology. Um, talking with things like, um, talking with things like, um, uh, with JD, uh, on things like the reusability of the booster rockets, right? The rockets going, uh, the boosters returning to earth and everything like that. I don't think it will be too long before they, um, before they, uh, you know, start having these manned, as I said, manned modules. I mean, right, right now the dragon crew module is very much the same iteration, uh, that you've seen in things like, <clears throat> you know, when you saw on the moon landing where a rocket booster went up and then, uh, you know, discharged this, the, the crew cap capsule, and then the capsule traveled on and then came back through, you know, basically gravitational thrust and gravitational assist, and it came back. Whereas I think one day you'll have that module attached to the rocket in such a way that it would only separate in the case of an emergency, and it literally would come back down to Earth and land just like you're seeing with these, um, uh, you're seeing with these booster stages that are coming down right now. I mean, they've got booster stages now that have completed was it 70? I think 70 is the highest one for the, a single booster has gone back and forth into space. 70. Um, it, you know, I, I would 70 times. Uh, and so, yeah. So if there is a chance of putting a, a, a moon hotel or a, not a moon hotel, but a, a space station hotel, up there where you could go and spend a night and then fly back. Oh man, that would be, like I said, if I won the lottery, that'd be the, that'd be one of the first things that I'd like to do. Can I just, please just let me fly up. And even if it was just the blue origin thing, uh, or even the Virgin galactic thing, and those get technically on the edge of space. But I mean, I want like a real space in orbit, geosynchronous kind of free floating. I really would like that. That would be a fun thing for me. Um, but that's why these kind of things just, uh, you know, flabbergast me. Here we've got an organization like NASA um, where they, they've kind of lost their, they've kind of lost the focus of their mission. They've lost the focus of where they're going. Um, they're so tied up in maintaining their legacy of, of actually launching into space, um, that they're, you know, they're wasting again, the SLS system costing $2 billion per launch, $2 billion per launch where SpaceX can do it for 200 million, $300 million for the same launch. Um, at what point do you just go, well, that makes no sense. Just farm it out, just contract it out. Uh, I mean, that, that would be, that would be some cool stuff. And then Rick in the chat room just said, I can't wait till we figure out how to travel at the speed of light. Oh man. I mean, that's the game changer, right? I mean, that's when a civilization goes from a starfaring civilization to, I mean, I mean, a regular civilization to an actual starfaring civilization. I mean, it takes months and months and years for, uh, you know, satellites to reach some of our nearest neighbors in the solar system, let alone, I mean, they've got, uh, what Voyager and some of these other ones are still, uh, are still inside the solar system. They're still transiting out, but they're still inside the solar system 40 years later inside the solar system to transit the, so when you see some of these shows where it's like, oh, we can, you know, <laughs> We're going to fly from, we're going to fly from the edge of the belt out to the moon and then back. And I mean, in today's space terms, that would take years to get back and forth. And in shows like The Expanse, because they have this MacGuffin called the Epstein Drive, uh, meaning they can create a highly efficient continuous thrust system that just keeps going and going and going. It, uh, you know, they, they make it out there 
uh, they can they can do it in a few days or a week or whatever. Anyway, um, I could just talk about I could talk about the whole idea of space and where it would go and and what you could do for forever. But uh, it definitely is good to see uh, that some things are changing and that we live in a time when this pri- these private companies are doing so much good work into uh, getting uh, in, into getting this stuff, uh, uh, this stuff, uh, you know, promulgated and, and pushed out there. Um, <clears throat> all right. What else do we have here? Um, I guess we're, I don't know if Mike Shower's not showing up or what. We'll, uh, we'll see what happens here in just a few minutes. Let's go back to, uh, the story that I was talking about earlier that I thought we were going to have for tomorrow, but why not? We'll talk about it now. So there's a new uh, push uh, in the state to use a crowdsourcing website to distribute COVID relief money. Now, in some ways, I'm like, well, this is kind of ingenious. But in other ways, I have a hesitation here. Alaska public school teachers This is from the Alaska Beacon. Alaska public school teachers short on supplies this year have a new source to to turn to for funding, and it's not the local school budget. Each teacher could receive $650 to $750 from the state in federal pandemic relief money. The DEED, the Department of Education and Early Development, is going to devote $2 million in federal pandemic relief money to fund teachers' requests. The acting department commissioner, Heidi Teschner, said in a news release that by helping teachers directly with their classroom needs, DEED is supporting our teachers in our shared mission to provide excellent education, yada, yada, yada. The department is going to fund the request through an online tool called Donors Choice, which is a crowdfunding website specifically for education um, to access the money. The state instructs teachers to create crowdfunding profiles and request. Deed said that they'll fund projects up to $1,000. Teachers can request up to $1,400, but then additional donors would have to cover the difference uh, on this because it's like a Kickstarter, not a Kickstarter. Um, um, what are the... Uh, I just had a... I just had a uh, I just uh, GoFundMe. It's like GoFundMe, right? So it's like a GoFundMe, but it's specifically for education called Donors Choose. Um, While the department said that the state funding per teacher would be up, this is the part that gets me. While the the department said the state funding per teacher would be up to $1,000, it suggests that teachers only request $650 to $750 in actual materials because of taxes, fees, and a suggested donation to the New York-based nonprofit Donors Choose. So, okay, taxes and fees and a donation. So we've got $2 million in COVID funds that's supposed to specifically go to help shore up the educational loss during COVID. And the state is now saying you can request it, but suggest that you only request 650 to 750 in actual materials. Which leads me to believe that, um, which leads me to believe that that means that twenty-five to thirty-five percent of that money is being sucked up into overhead, taxes, fees, and a suggested donation to the New York-based nonprofit. Now, I suppose the alternative would be for the state to create some kind of website or portal where teachers could submit, and the money could be the money could be funneled through there and that would probably cost some money. Although I don't know if it would cost up to 35% of the grant. So essentially for every thousand dollars that is being passed out in this $2 million grant up to 35% of it is being consumed by overhead. That's a pretty significant amount. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about of $2 million you're only going to get what 1.3 or $4 million out there because the rest of it's been sucked up by overhead. Uh, 
I mean, this is a unique opportunity, but I just think that that might be a 30, because again, 25 to 35%, well, 2 million, 25%, 500,000, 650,000. So you're talking about only 13, uh, $1.35 million actually getting out of the 2 million. The rest of it's been consumed by the system which seems to be counterintuitive. I appreciate what this Donors Choose program is doing, but and what tax are we talking about? Are we talking about New York taxes because it's a New York-based thing? Or are we talking about it? taxes and fees and suggested donation sucking up 25 to 35% of the revenues in the room? Ooh, that just, that just seems like that's a little, uh, wasteful, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Wasteful. That's what it feels like to me. But who knows? Maybe I'm just a grumpy old man who apparently hates children. Public education. Why do you hate children? I don't. That's not what I'm. All right. I gotta go. The Michael Duke show. Common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. We continue with more in the next segment. Um, If we don't get Mike Shower on, we'll just, uh, I think we'll just open up the phone lines and kick things off. What do you think? Back with more right after this. If you missed the show, you can listen to it on your time with Dukes On Demand. Oh, and it's free. Like America used to be. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. Um... Well, I mean, I don't know. Is it me? Am I just being grumpy about this? I mean, I think it's a great, the concept is a great idea to have teachers submit, you know, and all this stuff and to use the plugs. But when I started looking about, um, when I started looking at this and realizing that that was going to consume such a significant amount of that money. Then I, then I started to get a little, then I started to get a little down on it because you've got $2 million in funds and it's for a thousand dollars. They're going to give a thousand dollars, but that thousand dollar also includes all the costs involved. So now they're saying just ask for six fifty to seven fifty, and we'll pay the, and so is, I mean, I don't know. That's, I'm just, maybe I'm reading between the lines here, but the, you know, they will fund a project. The de- the deed will then fund the project up to $1,000. Each teacher could receive seven, 650 to 750 from the state in federal pandemic relief money. They said they could request up to 1400 but then additional donors would have to cover the difference. While the state said that funding per teacher would be up to a thousand dollars, it suggests the teachers only request 650 to 750 in actual materials because of taxes, fees, and a suggested donation to the New York-based nonprofit. So 650 to 750, it's 25 to 35% of the $1,000 is being consumed. But I, I mean, again, great, great idea. Great concept. But, um, Let me go over here to uh, financials, partnerships, equity focus, donors choose, teachers get funded, uh, about us, is there um, how it works, we find a project, see the order, transparency and efficiency, Um, see our finances, so they've got a link from finances, 95% of funding directly supports program costs. Um, 
programs also general and administrative. 1% is dedicated to running a lean organization. 4% we generate funding from outside teachers, personal network. 75% of donations from donation choose comes from donors who've never met a teacher. It doesn't tell you what the cost of um, total project cost, fulfillment, third appraisal, partial fees, sales tax. Okay, so here's a breakdown. Wobble chairs for kids. So a wobble chair blue, they bought 12 of these chairs at 60 bucks a piece, $719.88. So they actually have a, they actually have a example here. So it costs $720 for the chairs. Shipping charges were free. Sales tax was 50 bucks. Sales tax where? Every state has a different example status of the thing. Okay, t sales tax in their example is 50 bucks. Third party processing fee, $10. Fulfillment labor and materials, $30. Total project cost, $811. Suggested donation to help donors choose me for more class classrooms, $143. For a total of $954. So it was a $720 project that cost $954. That's 25%. So 25%. So of the $2 million they're going to put towards this project, only one, only one and a half million is going to make it into the actual classroom. I don't know. Maybe I'm just, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm just... Oh, Donors Choose has 170 staff, says Donna. Maybe I'm, uh, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, maybe that's wasteful. Okay. Um, that, no, yeah. Okay. I don't know what else I want to talk about today. I'm still thinking about space. Back with more of the Michael Duke Show. Okay, welcome back to the program. The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty-based, free-thinking radio. Uh, I think it's going to be me and you for the remainder of the hour. Uh, I believe Mr. Shower may have been called away to... Uh, call, called away to... Called away to fly somewhere else for a short period of time here uh which means uh, we need to open up the phone lines and uh we'll throw the phones to you i'm i mean i'm i'm still stuck on the space thing quite honestly i'm just i'm stuck on the space thing and would love to hear from you if you want to talk about your favorite science fiction series that would be fun today so I guess what I'll just throw, I'm just going to, we're going to put the phone lines open. Now, uh, I had a long conversation yesterday with GCI tech support over the telephone situation. And unfortunately, um, they're working on it, but it's still not finished. So we're still using the other number, which is unfortunate because it's not as easy to, it's not as easy to recall, but that's not the right number. Doggone it. Uh, so. For those of you who are keeping track at home, let me uh, let me let me throw let me throw the number out there for you to review. It's 319-319-527-3864. 319-527-3864. I know that's not your normal number. I know that's not what we normally call, 
but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. Jeannie says she wants to talk about mental health. Jeannie, call up and let's talk about mental health. If you want to talk about that, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear what you have to say about that. But at this point, we'll just say any topic is fair game. I was just talking with JD at the very end of the last hour uh, about uh, some of his, um, about a book, one of the books that I just uh, was thinking about in regards to space exploration and going out and doing it on our own. Um, and uh, it was uh, Travis J. Corcoran. Uh, Ta- uh, Travis, actually, excuse me, Travis J. I. Corcoran. Um, anyway, it, uh, I, I love his book. There's, uh, the, the powers of the earth is the name of the first book and the causes of, uh, separation is the, uh, is the next book, but, uh, what a great, what a great, uh, series, uh, very Heinlein like in its, uh, in its take on exploration and space and so much more, but you should go check it out. Uh, if you haven't, I posted links up in the chat room to, uh, to his, to his work. And, uh, you can read that as well. Maybe I should get, uh, maybe I should get, uh, him on the program to talk about writing the book because I do enjoy talking to authors about, uh, the, the idea and the reasoning and everything else. Okay. Um, so number again to call for those of you who want three, one, nine, five, two, seven, three, eight, six, four. If you want to sound off now, uh, we, we can find out more about it. Um, I was just talking about this, uh, <clears throat> new crowdsourcing website that they're going to be using to display the, the, they're going to distribute this COVID funds with. And during the break, I went out and actually visited the website and I found, um, I found a, uh, uh, a deal on, on how they broke it down. And yeah, even in their, even in their example here, um, they're taking 25% of the, uh, they're taking 25% of the money in overhead. So the money goes in, they scrape off about 25% and you get 75% in the end. Meaning, so the state's going to give them $2 million in COVID funds, and they're actually only going to distribute 1.5 million. And the state is saying up to 35%. So it could be as low as 1.34 million. Um, but I just don't think that that's the most efficient way. Do you, I mean, is it me or is it, yeah, I mean, it, it just doesn't seem to me like it's the most efficient way. Um, all right, let's go to the phones. Uh, I don't want to ramble too much because I'm just, uh, I'm again, I'm stuck on the whole space thing, but let's go over here and see what you have to say. Randy's on the phone from Fairbanks. Good morning, Randy. How are you? How'd you know? It was me? I am. I have, I have my ways, my friend. I have my ways. What's on your mind? Well, hello, Mr. Kreskin. <laughs> yes. I've hold the envelope um, up to my head. What's I read? A... Yeah. I, I read some happy news in uh, the Fairbanks Daily News Miner on Monday, uh, July 31st. Uh, they have a neat section where they go back in time uh, 50 years ago, 75 years ago, 100 years ago. And I've been following this story about President Harding, who came up uh, to Alaska a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, 100 years ago, that is, uh, and visited Alaska. He was the first U.S. president to do so. And he uh, went to Nenana and drove the Golden Spike in. And uh, as you know, they have a, the Harding car, the rail car that he actually rode in uh, out at Pioneer Park here in Fairbanks. But uh, after his tour to Alaska, he then got on board ship and made his way toward the lower 48. <clears throat> However, he kind of got under the weather a little bit. And uh, uh, but but uh, uh, half a report in this Monday news miner for uh, July 31st. You know, this is 100 years ago, by the way. But it says here Harding passed the best night. Comparatively, since he has been ill, the statement continued, that augurs well. Conditions seem to warrant this. the statement that he has gotten into clear sailing. Harding took some nourishment this morning and read the morning papers. The morning bulletin said, quote, the president had a fairly comfortable night with a considerable restful sleep. His temperature at 9 o'clock was 100. 
his pulse 120, his respiration 40 and regular. There had been uh, no extension of the mnemonic areas and his heart action uh, showed definite improvement. Nourishment um, uh, and fluids were being taken regularly. Elimination was satisfactory. Boy, they go into the details here. But anyway, they go on to tell some good, helpful signs. And so I was happy to hear that, that he seems to be on the mend. <laughs> but that was 100 years ago. So he is dead now. But, I mean, at the time, it was good news is what you're saying. Really. Yeah, no, I mean, but that was a, I was saying that was 100 years ago. I mean, he's dead now. But at the time, that was good news is what you're saying. Yes, yes, at the time. I, I get kind of caught up in it, you know, following this story. I, I guess so. I guess so. Well, it is fascinating to read those moments in history and to look back and see that stuff. Uh, it is good to see. And, uh, you know, Harding also, uh, that's, uh, I believe that's where the name Harding Lake came from, that they named the lake in honor of his visit. So there you go. Uh, another interesting pit, uh, a tidbit of history for you. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate you. Uh, Appreciate you coming on board. Uh, let's go over here. Jeannie is down uh, on the peninsula. Uh, Jeannie, what's on your mind this morning? Well, Michael, good morning. Good morning, six o'clock. There's... Good morning. That's interesting. Oh, sorry about that. that the echo was horrible. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the mental health system, not just in Alaska, but the other models that are out there in other states. Since Reagan defunded the state hospitals and, you know, went, you know, to the extreme of closing all those down, we've had this problem. And it's not going to get better until Alaska decides to look at the other models and decide which one it can afford. Well, nobody can afford it. Right, right. It's like the school district. The schools get property. Is this correct? The schools get property to either sell or lease or develop in order to be able to fund their education programs. Well, is that, that correct? Yeah, that's the University of Alaska is a land grant college, meaning they were given lands and then they okay. could dispose of those lands either through rents or purchase or sale or whatever. So the university, not regular schools, but the university does. Okay. So what does mental health use as the foundation in Alaska for their funding? Well, mental the Mental Health Trust, and boy, this is now you're getting me into an area that I know uh, very little about. I have a basic understanding um, uh, about that. The Mental Health Trust basically does something similar where they had a set group of a set batch of land giving given to them to then use for advocacy, planning, implementing, you know, mental health uh, issues in the state of Alaska. So very similar to a land grant, they were given us an amount of money and then they are basically relegated to putting it out there. What does their website say for for their, uh, the Alaska is, And they have a thing is there's of land and other non cash assets to generate revenue to benefits. Again, very much like the land grant where they're supposed to make money out of that and do things. Uh, I don't know exactly what they. I don't know exactly what they're doing, but that's what they're supposed to do. Right. That's the point. What are they doing? They're not doing, right? There are other programs, examples of programs out there that aren't perfect, but that work so much better than what they're doing here. Down here on the peninsula, if you have somebody walking around that's obviously having a schizophrenic break or some level of psychosis, and you call 911 to have them, you know, taken care of, they go down to CPH, they get IV fluids, they get a little nutrition, they make sure that they have clothes, appropriate clothes for the weather, and out the door they go. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's a not mental health care. Well, look, I think you hit on something, and this has been a bone of contention with me for a long time. 
that, you know, uh, we've talked about this and this, this falls into so many different areas of our lives, everything from the homelessness issue to some of the other issues, I think, to even some of the issues of violence that we've seen on the streets and some of the shootings and things when Reagan dismantled the system in the eighties, um, it, the, the problem wasn't that he dismantled it. The problem was they did not offer any alternative to it once they did it. They, they just basically shut it down and let everything just kind of blow free in the wind. I'm not saying that those state mental health hospitals. Well, they made it the state's problem is what they did. They put it on the state. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree That's with that. That's the problem. I mean, the, the states had no plan. Yeah, I mean, the problem was, you know, these places, a lot of these places were horrific. I mean, you see the stories, you saw the news articles, you saw the exposés, oh. you saw how, I mean, horrible some of these places were. Not all of them, but many of them were, I mean, they were hell. They were living hell for these patients uh, and these people. And that, again, I go back to you trust government to run these kind of things. But the problem was, is that there was no path forward. Nope. There was no path forward. There was no blueprint. They basically just dismantled it and said, you guys do with it what you will. And that is part of the problem. And we're reaping those benefits, quote unquote, those rewards or those problems. We're reaping the oh, harvest boy. of that. Here we are, you know, 40 years later, reaping the the harvest of that, of that uh, action. And I think that was one of his greatest missteps, quite honestly. Agreed. And I think we have to take that one step farther. This gentleman that's having problems swinging a stick in a park, we all know what's going to end up happening. The law enforcement hands are tied. There is nothing they can do until he commits a crime. However, emergency mental health people, if there was such a program, could go out, contact him, get him into the hospital, get his mental situation taken care of, medicate him, keep him there for 72 hours and release him again if he's doing better. And if he's not, have a panel like they do in other states where there's a judge and two psychiatrists advocating for the patient and make a decision. Is he fit for the public? Is he not fit for the public? If right. he's not fit for the public, he needs to go to emergency mental health facility. Yeah. Which they again, have them here. They just don't use them. Yeah. I mean, which again is part, of, again, this whole issue with this guy. And for those of you who don't know what she's talking about, there's a story, news story in Anchorage about a guy who's been picked up and let go three different times in the last four weeks, who's been threatening people and doing property damage out on the walking trails around Anchorage. And uh, it reminded me of the of the stabbing at the Lusack Library in Anchorage, where a guy just randomly came up behind a lady and stabbed her and paralyzed her with a knife. That guy had also been in and out of uh, jail for various problems, and they keep releasing him. He's obviously just escalating it over and over. And I agree with you, Jeannie. I think this is something that needs to be addressed. It is an issue. And like I said, it has ramifications in so many different areas from homelessness to violence and things like that. Uh, but we're just, we're not, I don't know if we're just not willing to talk about, or we just don't have the will to do it. I don't know what's going on with it, but you're right. It's an important point. We're out of time for the second, hold the second, uh, Jeannie, we'll be right back to you. The Michael Duke show, common sense radio, uh, back with more right after this. Okay. Sorry about that. I got so wrapped up with Jeannie that I was running right up against the uh, break there. Uh, Jeannie, I just want to give you a final bite at the uh, at the apple here because uh, I was I was out of time. So any final thoughts here before I let you go? Sure. My, my biggest issue is, and I guess this was the whole point to the phone call for me, was if they have the assets and they have the ability to generate the income, why are they not using it? Why are they just sitting on it with their arms crossed and their thumbs in their ears trying to figure out how we're going to fix this problem when the answer to the problem is right there? Generate the income, spend the money. That's all they got to do. Find a model that they like and, and implement it. Yeah. And I don't know if any state has really fixed this problem, quite honestly. I mean, there are some models out there that probably work better oh, than others. There's a lot of states that have done well, actually. Uh, which uh, Give me some examples, because again, I haven't followed this issue close enough to be... So, Washington, Oregon, and California all have state-run facilities for the housing of not just criminally insane, but medically unstable mental health patients. 
pretty much everybody on the Pacific Coast has figured it out. So they have lesser restrictive alternatives where people go in front of the panel and the judge says, sorry, you know, you can do this, this and this, but you have to take your medications at this time on these days and we're going to supervise it. So these people have to make their way to the emergency mental health, get their medication, and then they can go about and do whatever they want. As long as they're on their meds, they're generally stable and safe. But this is the problem. They go off their meds and now they're a danger to society and yeah, literally yeah. a danger. No, a danger. Literally. I mean, again, this poor woman, I saw an interview with her about four months ago, uh, still in a wheelchair, still trying to recover, probably won't re probably won't uh, re regain the use of her legs. Um, after this, again, just random attack. He just ran. There was no reason, no rhyme, no reason. Just literally came up behind her and stabbed her in the back uh, right there. And uh, and is the state for, not for, worried about vicarious liability for that act? I, I don't know. I mean, apparently not. Apparently it hasn't been a big issue. I mean, APD had <laughs> recycled this guy. Uh, several times in and out of the system for various kind of attacks against women and things like that. Uh, just kind of random acts of violence. And he was back out on the street. So I apparently it's not that high a priority for them. Apparently not. And, you know, it's just going to come to a head. And this guy in the park in Anchorage is going to either get killed or he's going to really hurt somebody. And then people are going to have to wonder what are they doing with their assets? Yeah. Why aren't they taking care of this problem? Yeah. Sitting on their thumbs. I agree. It's not, it's not moving forward. All right, Jenny. Well, thank you so much for your call. Appreciate you uh, calling in this morning. Thank you, Michael. All right. Bye. Come on back over here. Um, leaving and coming back. All right. There we go. Who's this and where are you calling from? Brad from Fairbanks. Okay, Brad, hold the line. I'm going to be right back to you here in just a minute. You're going to be first up as soon as we return to the radio, which is in about 90 seconds. Okay. So hold the line, Brad in Fairbanks. And I see the Barbara's on the line as well. So we'll continue to take those, uh, we'll continue to take those issues as well. Holy cow. Um, um, going back up here, see what you guys have to say. I have observed that Randy, uh, yada, yada, yada. We're always reaping something. We're always reaping something around here. Um, going where it can't stall them out. Um, Harold says they don't even do the coastal trail anymore. Alaska is a quagmire. Um, danger of all the government. Um, mental health is, uh, say, rah, 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 rah. they have uh, having a state program. Uh, Tyler says having a state run program like that sounds like a good way to get sued. If someone is on a state program, commits a crime, sounds like they'd be sued. Uh, possibly. I mean, I guess, I don't know what the answer is to that though. I, I don't, I don't know what the answer, the, I mean, this whole mental health issue is such a huge issue, um, that I don't know what the answer is. I know that basically dismantling the system without any other alternatives and no roadmap and no path to do for was not the right answer. And we're seeing that today, of course, you know, 35, 40 years later, we're seeing those things today. Um, all right. <clears throat> We're going to go back to this. Brad is up in Fairbanks. We're going to be talking to him here in just a hot second. The Michael Duke show, common sense, Liberty based free thinking radio, like and share, like, and follow, do all the stuff. Let's, uh, let's get back to it. One final segment. Here we go.
All right, we're coming back in. Uh, one final segment. Phone lines are open. And apparently, the phone line, the regular phone line is working all of a sudden because Brad just called in on it. Brad is up in Fairbanks. Let's get his hot take on what's going on, what's on his mind this morning. Good morning, Brad. What's up? What are you thinking? What's on your mind? Hey, good morning, Michael. Long time listener, first time caller. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for calling in. Uh, appreciate you uh, being part of it today. What uh, What are you thinking? What's up? What are your thoughts? Well, um, I just want to say for a little uh, uh, shout out to the Fairbanks Vet Center. They relocated, or we have loca- uh, relocated. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Fairbanks Vet Center. So uh, I heard that uh, your last um, spot was talking about behavioral health counseling and behavioral health and how the state is. Uh, is lacking and stuff. Um, I kind of, I kind of agree, but then again, I don't because uh, what she failed to say is that uh, is the, the west, the west coast is a big st- uh, state tax um, behavioral health medical type of uh, base state, and we're not. So um, I just want to do a little highlight for the Fairbanks Vet Center. They did relocate from Fourth Avenue downtown in Fairbanks to uh, the old. Um, to the old building by the Alaska Club at 751 Old Richardson Highway. Okay. Um, and the old Teamster building, as you all know where that is. And uh, we're doing pretty good for behavioral health. Okay. For vets out there at the vet center. I mean, that's good. I mean, do you, do you, uh, do you disagree with my analysis, Brad, that, I mean, part of the problem was, is that they dismantled the whole system without really giving any kind of path or roadmap or plan forward. Was that. Is that Lucia? No, I'm sorry. I'm uh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm here, Brad. I guess I was asking, do you think that I'm out of line when I said that basically part of the problem here is a dismantling of the system without really laying a roadmap forward? Do you think that there should have been a better plan or outline or at least some kind of, I guess, form of a plan on that? Uh, are you um, referring for behavioral health for the state? I'm talking about when Reagan dismantled the statewide, the nationwide healthcare, you know, mental health systems and shut down the state hospitals and the, and the insane asylums and things like that without having a plan for what to do with people who are suffering from those kind of ailments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember growing up in the, uh, the Reagan years and listening to my, my parents and my grandparents talk about that. And, um, I don't, we still don't know why, uh, President Reagan did all that, even though that he had a really good, uh, a really good department of behavioral health and all this uh, medical um, experts and stuff like that. It was kind of a, it was kind of a not a shocker, but eye raising uh, part of why he did that, since he did have the money and he did have the uh, behavioral health professionals. Yeah. Well, anyway, Jason, well, I appreciate you uh, giving us the heads up about the vet center moving out to the old rich there next to the Alaska club. Thank you for giving us the heads up and, and th- I'm glad that uh, they have some <laughs> options available there for them. Thank you for coming on the program and being part of it. Uh, <clears throat> so the phone line's still real crackly on that end. I don't know why. Let's go over to Barbara who called in directly and I'm sure she's probably going to be clear as a bell. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. How are you? I am fine. Uh, doing well. What's on your mind today? Uh, I've got two issues. Uh, I, mine has a really bad echo, so if I pause, that's why. But um, first, there is an Alaska Mental Health Roadmap Conference today at the Witchwood in Fairbanks, being sponsored by the Department of, of Health. Well, that, about that? that's a, there's uh, some irony, some, some synchronicity for you. And, uh, that starts at 10 o'clock at Wedgwood. And if people are interested, I suppose they can come on out. Um, the, uh, department, the commissioner, and a couple other folks are going to be out there. Um, the other thing, the second thing, I guess three things. The second thing, there is a piece of legislation that is actually being aimed at the uh, LUSAC, the stabbing at the LUSAC issue. And I'm sorry, I don't remember the House bill number off the top of my head, but I know that the hearings were in April. And if you scroll through the uh, 
HHS House hearings, you will probably find that testimony pretty easily. And that bill should be out of committee next session. Okay. The third thing, the more important thing, for me at least, um, is tomorrow night at the Borough Assembly, they're going to be talking about a $3 million project at Chain of Lakes. And if you live on Black Road or somewhere in that area, you might be, you might want to listen to the Finance Committee discussion on that because um, while I'm excited about the project, I'm a little concerned that there hasn't been much in the way of public discussion about the project. And um, what, gosh, do, what uh, does the what does the pub what does the project include, uh, Barbara? What are, what are they doing for three million dollars out of Chena Lakes? Well, you know, at the end of Plaque Road, it, the pavement ends and it becomes a gravel road, which is ran by a service area. And then there's that you know there's that gate there. Um, it looks like to me it always looked like a guardrail, but they claim it's a gate. Okay. I'm not going to argue with them. And it's all overgrowth. And, you know, like the kids used to ride their bikes through there. It's like kind of the back way into Chain of Lakes to avoid right. paying the fees. <laughs> back right. In the day. right. If you remember that. They're going to knock that all down and they're going to make a big old parking area and a boat launch and a mm -hmm. snow machine. Um, you know, a place where you can unload your snow machine from a pick -em up truck. And uh looks nice. But, um, you know, if you live out there, like if you live on Tanada, Tanada or Nelson or some of those other little offshoot roads, you know, this is something that could have an impact on your life. And you probably want to have some say or input or at least follow what's going on with this because, uh, you know, uh, it's going to have an impact on your daily life. Yeah. No, it would be good to know. I wonder, did they notify all the people in those areas? that this is going on or not, <clears throat> if it's going to affect the road service area or anything else. But you said tomorrow night, six o'clock. Well, I Go ahead. Well, the, the finance committee starts at 530 and that's where it's currently at. So um, I did call contact the road service commissions because I, uh, Gordon and I think the other one's called Moose Meadows because I was concerned that they might have an, a project going on that, might be superfluous if we do this project so um and and also because they know the people out there when we right, go to a right. moose meadow uh, road there's like 40 people show up that's not how it is in some road service commissions they've got a pretty active commission out there so, right right um you know i just thought if some kind of discussion or rollout or something you know um, All right, Barbara. Kind of there hasn't been. So tomorrow night, 5.30, Finance Committee meeting, $3 million project for Chena Lakes in Fairbanks. Uh, appreciate you uh, sounding off. I got Carl on the line here, but we're not going to be able to get him on the air. Carl, hold the line. We'll get to you off the air here real quick. Folks, we're out of time for today. Tomorrow is another one. Thank you for coming on board and joining us. It is the Michael Duke Show, common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. We will see you tomorrow, my friends. Have a great day. All right, Carl called in late here, but let's see what he has to say. Good morning, Carl. What's on your mind? Um, good morning, Michael. This oh, it's is Car Carlene. And oh, sorry, Carlene. It just says it, it, the caller ID only says Carl. It doesn't give me the full name. So, hi, Carlene. What's on your mind? <laughs> My father's name was Carl. To fish come over St. Patty's Day, it was like Wednesday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Providence Kodiak Island Medical Center had a booth. So I spoke with the, um, the individual there, and she told me that the hospital takes in people for a counseling they just need to go, I don't know if they go to the clinic across the street from the hospital or if it's in the hospital building itself. So that's really good to know if people have issues, that there is help. Right, right, absolutely. No, the hospitals will take care of it, but they're not equipped to deal with it en masse. And I think that's part of the problem, especially when we look at issues like homelessness and others where there's the mental health is a big component of some of those problems. 
Uh, I just don't think that they're equipped to deal with it uh, as they would have been back, you know, again in the day under uh, <clears throat> under the larger systems. Again, not that those systems were great because there was a lot of abuse and problems and things like that. But overall, uh, we need to find a better solution. And But there is still help out there. It's just it, I don't think it's as organized or as, as easy to find, Carly. So thank you so much. It's good to hear from you. Thank you for calling in this morning and being part of it. I appreciate it. Folks, we're out of time. I got to go. I got a whole day's worth of stuff to do. We will see you tomorrow. Have a great day. Goodbye. We've shed our terrestrial radio skin, and now we are slimy lizard internet people. It's the Michael Duke Show.